Welcome to Sarder TV. I'm Vishali Jain. I'm excited to introduce you to the special episode we created with the New York Hall of Science. The New York Hall of Science is not only the city's leading hands-on museum for science and technology, it's also a global leader in informal education in science, technology, engineering, and math. In this special presentation, a leading venture capitalist, Fred Wilson, and a popular science author, Stephen Johnson, will guide you through a discussion about blockchain, Bitcoin, and cryptocurrency. Enjoy. Good evening, everybody. I'm Margaret Honey. I am the president and CEO of the New York Hall of Science. And I want to begin this evening with Stuart, thanking our trustee, Stuart Fisher, for hosting us. That is such a lovely space, Stuart. Thank you. You guys know each other? Are you bonded already? So to get us started this evening, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce another trustee and founding member of our President's Council, Gene Sullivan. Gene is a co-founder of Starvest Partners, a New York City-based venture capital firm, and is currently a general partner at the ArcView Group, a firm that connects investors and entrepreneurs to deals and information in the emerging cannabis market. She's also the reason why we have the pleasure of hosting both Fred Wilson and Stephen Johnson tonight. So please join me in welcoming Jean, who's going to get things rolling. Margaret, thank you, thank you. Does anybody in the room think that being a VC is an easy thing to do? Well, Fred Wilson makes it look easy. And does anybody else think that being an author and writing 10 books, oh, and wait a minute, one more coming this fall is an easy thing? Uh, that's what Steven Johnson does. Pretty amazing, I'd say, wouldn't you? So, and what about the horsepower that it takes to put together crypto and, and blockchain and sort through all that co complexity? Uh, I'd say it takes a pretty high uh, brain power and horsepower. But here's what's fun about tonight. This is for sure harmonic convergence because the New York Hall of Science believes in showing little kids and big kids what STEM learning and science and these complex subjects are all about, opening the door to young people and a few people that are beyond that uh, word and uh, myself included, a curiosity for learning that we all have. That's who's in the room, Fred and Stephen, as you so carefully asked tonight. Who is in this room and why are they here? Do they even know why they're coming here tonight? I said, oh yes. <laughs> Not only to see the two of you and hear from you, but because of the subject matter. So here's what's so cool. Fred Wilson has worked tirelessly, tirelessly for years to open the minds of the uh, New York public schools by bringing uh, computer science to, the, to both teachers and students throughout the whole public school system. That's a phenomenal effort. Started several years ago and now really getting some traction. It's just amazing. And he's chairperson of a couple big initiatives, one called Tech New York City and the other CS for All, Computer Science for All. So again, that's right in sync what New York Hall is all about. So Dr. Margaret Honey, who you just met, who's so amazing, and her dynamic team work so hard to bring hands-on experience to the New York Hall of Science, which by the way, since the first time I became part of this great group said, it's the best kept secret in New York City. It's phenomenal. If you haven't been there, I welcome you. And I want you to be part of what we're doing. Not only this great, wonderful venue that's on somewhat near City Field right there, but also has created a STEM hub for the community in Corona, an after-school homework program that really incorporates kids that may not have any idea what STEM is till they walk in that place. Amazing. Uh, a story is that 95% of the high school kids that are part of their program go on to college and two thirds declare STEM majors. I'd say that's accomplishment, wouldn't you? <laughs> so we also welcome you to the President's Council. Many of us are part of that and many of you are guests of us because we believe these programs like tonight 
sorting through complex and interesting science issues are what the President's Council can do as an additional group of people who care about building these kinds of programs for kids, little kids, big kids. I'd like to think I'm one of those. So uh, we want you to consider joining us as part of this council to help us you know, create these programs. It's important. So back to our wonderful and important guest tonight. Fred Wilson is not just a VC. He is a luminary in our business, and he has invested in some of the most successful companies in the world. You know many of them, Twitter and Etsy and Littlebit, uh, the CEO we honored her at the New York Hall a few years ago. Uh, so he's not only a thinker, he's a driver, he's a creator of these great programs and a fabulous investor for many years. And Stephen Johnson, Stephen, I heard you speak many years ago in some of your first books, both about the brain and future perfect. Now, 10 years later, I don't, 10 books later, I don't know how you do that, and 11 is around the corner. And today, Fred, thank you for the shout out you gave us in your blog, which said, talking with Stephen is one of my most favorite things to do. <laughs> that is so kind of you to say. Yeah. And if you want to fill your brain with even more, Sign up for Fred's wonderful blog post, which is just so great. He writes it every day, even when he's not in the mood to write it. And thank you for that. I've learned so much over the years. So Fred is first going to give us a short overview of what we're talking about. And then Stephen and Fred are going to have a conversation about this. And by the way, Stephen's uh, next book coming this fall is called Farsighted, How We Make Decisions That Matter Most. Boy, I could have used you along the way for that. <laughs> I, I can think of plenty of decisions that needed a lot of, uh, of help. He's also the host of uh, one of the number one podcasts, American Innovations, and hosts the PBS series, How We Got to Now. Well, I'd like to know how we got to now and a few things. Could, could you do anything about things down in uh, the DC area? <laughs> and since we're talking about blockchain and Bitcoin, you must read his seminal article, which was published in January in the New York Times. Uh, and so hopefully we'll put this, I know we sent it out to many of you and we'll put it on the website. Hopefully Sue can read it. So I welcome Fred and Stephen to our stage. We want you to fill our brains tonight and untangle the secrets of blockchain and crypto. Please come on up and throw in a few crypto kitties for us too, will you? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start with a couple words. Okay. Thank you, Gene, for that incredible uh, introduction. So we were upstairs uh, on the roof deck, and um, I decided I wanted to take a photo of Central Park. Um, so I sauntered over, and, uh, and I bumped into a really nice couple who's sitting right over there. And I asked them you know, why, we were, why they were here, and they said, you know, interested in the topic. And I did my best to sort of explain blockchain to them. And the thing that's challenging about this topic is that it's a complicated topic. And it's not really simple to understand. Um, and I've been investing in and working in and around this sector for somewhere between six and seven years now. And uh, I've tried to explain uh, this sector to literally thousands of people. And uh, actually tried to explain it the other night at dinner to a friend of mine, and I still struggle with it. So, <laughs> so we're going to do our best uh, tonight to try to simplify this and, and make it understandable, but um, it, is, it is a challenging topic. Uh, and I think one of the things that's challenging about it is that it is, in some ways, a financial story. It's a financial asset. People buy it. People sell it. People trade it. And so a lot of people, when they think of blockchain, think of Bitcoin, think of crypto, they think of Wall Street, they think of financial services, they think of money. And, and it is, in some ways, about that. But it's also um, about uh, something completely different. But it is also, like the internet uh, before it and other things before it, it is technology. It's a new way of building things. And and I think in some ways that's the more exciting piece of it and the part of the story that doesn't get told as much, but I think is what makes it uh, so powerful and so exciting. So what I hope you all come away with 
for spending your evening with us. When you leave is the ability to do, which is when someone says to you, what is blockchain, what is crypto, what, what is that whole thing? I hope you'll be able to uh, explain it uh, to your friends. And, um, I, uh, and so that, that's our goal tonight. And so with that, I'm going to invite Stephen to come up, and the two of us are going to have a conversation. Well, first off, I just want to say uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I spent a lot of hours when my kids were younger in the Hall of Science. Um, it, it is an incredible space. Uh, I'm sure all of you have been there uh, by the fact that you're here, but I, I just want to express my appreciation for all those long winter Saturdays where we were able to pass the time uh, in an intellectually enriching environment um, and not just fighting in our basement. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here, and, and it's always great to be with Fred. So it's funny you said that about trying to explain blockchain. I have a very distinct memory, and which I pretty much I'm pretty sure I can date to 2011 of hanging out with you and somehow you brought up Bitcoin, basically. I'm not even sure if we were calling it blockchain at that definitely point. Definitely were not. Yeah, yeah. Definitely so you brought up Bitcoin. That's an, that, was a, that was a term when once Bitcoin became like, you know, bad because people were using it to buy drugs on the internet. <laughs> not pot, but other drugs. Um, and uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so we, we like, like change the term to blockchain. Right, right. Well, I think we can come back to that because that's an interesting shift conceptually, I think. But I remember you're talking about it. you were very enthusiastic, you know, at that early stage. And I remember saying to you, Fred, I do not understand what this thing is. Like, I feel like I'm pretty technologically sophisticated. I was there in the early days of the web and HTML, and I, got, I could see what was coming. But I just cannot get my head around that. And I asked you to explain it. and. I remember just still being baffled by it, and it and it literally took me like six or seven years until I started writing that article for the Times Magazine before I finally got it. And I think this is a pattern that I've noticed that you and I share a lot of ideas and values, but I'm generally about six or seven years behind you. I think is the is there, it, it tends to work. So, but I wanted to go back to that because the I'm curious, and maybe you don't remember this, but I'm curious, like, what was it initially? I mean, this is probably two. So there's a very famous paper that was published in 2009. Yeah, the, the Satoshi Nakamoto white. It's kind paper. of a white paper about this new form of crypto that could support a currency. And so it's only two years after they were put, you know, posted on this obscure crypto mailing list. Right. Um, so two years later, you've sensed something there. Like, what was it about that early idea that resonated? So. I have a sort of a belief system, uh, you know, I guess you could call it, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, it's not religious per se, but it's like a religious belief um, in the internet and the technology that powers the internet. And it's, it really is rooted in the idea that the internet itself is not controlled by anybody. It really isn't. Um, there is no company that controls the internet. There's no no, no, no country that controls the internet. There's no organization. Nobody can make a change to the internet um, willy-nilly, and nobody can take it down. Obviously, China can put up a wall, but even that wall is pretty penetrable. So, and that, of course, in our lifetime, has unleashed just an incredible amount of innovation. And so, um, my belief system is that the most powerful technologies are technologies that nobody controls and that are open to anybody and anybody can do anything on it, bad or good. And I don't love the bad part of it, but you know, that is a belief system. And so that's what got me interested in the internet in 92, 93, 94, when I first started working in the internet, investing in the internet. And nothing really has come along since then. Maybe open source software, which was emerging at around the same time as the internet, uh, that felt like that. Uh, and in 2011, I bumped into a friend of mine um, on the street here in Manhattan. We, he was walking this way, I was walking this way. I hadn't seen him in three or four years. And I said, Ricky, you know, what's going on? What are you doing? And he said, I'm starting a Bitcoin company. And I said, Bitcoin company? What's, what the hell is a Bitcoin, right? 2011. And um, he said, oh, it's this amazing thing that, you know, you can, you know, clear financial transactions, without a central authority, and nobody controls it, and it's just a protocol, and literally anybody can do it, and it's completely permissionless innovation. And I was like, 
you know, that was it. Right. Like, it was like, you know, I'd met a hard Krishna guy who converted me on the street <laughs> of Manhattan. Like, that was it. I was converted. I went back. Airports after that. Exactly. So years, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and I went back and I read the white paper, and I have a partner named Albert who's one of the most brilliant computer scientists that I've ever met. And I sent him the white paper. I said, read this thing. It's amazing. And, uh, and you know, the next day I went to the office. I said, what do you think? He said, that's. This is really important. He said, there's some things I don't like about the design of Bitcoin, um, which were really actually um, arguments against the Bitcoin design more so than the, the central innovation. And I just said, look, I got to start, you know, uh, we got to start investing in this. So that was, that was it. That's what did it for me. It was just that it, 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 it just mapped into my belief system. Yeah. And at that stage, I think it's fair to say, the, I, I think now there are several innovations that are associated with right. it, but at that stage, just to kind of e explain to folks who aren't as first in this, I think it's decentralized trust right. is, is the big thing that was suddenly possible. Can you just explain that a little bit more right. compared so, to the other ways that we right. had tr trusted kind so, of systems? So if I sell a stock to you and you buy it, there has to be a central clearinghouse that validates that transaction, who says, yeah, Fred actually owns the stock, he can sell it to you, and we're made safe in that way by the New York Stock Exchange or Morgan Stanley or whoever that central authority is who says that transaction's valid. Same thing with banking. I send you, you know, 50 bucks because I lost on the golf course to you, which I always do. <laughs> <laughs> you actually, sometimes when, because you start talking about cryptocurrencies as we're playing, and that really is very distracting. But <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so, you know, Chase Manhattan Bank has to manage that transaction to make sure that um, it's a valid transaction. So that's the way it's always been. And those are really, we, we even called them trusts in some parts of the financial system. Those are trusted, you know, clearinghouses or, or agents that um, make it possible for you and I to do business together without necessarily trusting each other. And so what, at its core, what this technology now allows is for the network. So think about the internet as a network, right? There's all these nodes on the internet that make it so that internet, that, so that packets of data can flow across the internet using protocols. Now we have a protocol that allows the network to validate the transaction as opposed to some central authority. And there's a financial incentive, um, which is called the block reward in the Bitcoin protocol for those people to do that. And that was a piece of the innovation. What Satoshi Nakamoto, who may or may not be a person, I personally think Satoshi Nakamoto was a group of people who were working together He's on this. He's the guy who wrote the white paper, right? Yeah, yeah. What Satoshi Nakamoto did was stitch together a couple of pieces of technology into a protocol that works. And the reason, and we know it works because the Bitcoin network has been around now for almost 10 years, and there are, you know, literally, you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of machines out there around the world that are processing these transactions and clearing these transactions, and nobody owns that. Like, it's just a network, and they're all cooperating and clearing these transactions. It's never been different operators on the network may have been hacked, but the network itself has never been hacked. It is a secure transaction processing system that's decentralized. Chris Dixon, who's written about this a lot, it's uh, another VC, had a great line that he said to me when I was doing that piece, which was, you, you know what the concept of a bug bounty is? Like if you're like, okay, you've got your software, you put up a bounty for anybody who can break into this software, this service, or whatever it is, I'll give you a million dollars, you know, right. and that you, you got he said, this is the bug, he said this is the biggest bug bounty ever, He's right? Like, this is literally like a $20 billion bug bounty, and, and it's been intact for, right. for 10 years. Nobody has been able to, to break it. So we know it's secure right. on, on that level, just cryptographically secure. And there's another thing that I think is super powerful, and I, and I think pretty easy to understand. So if you think about all the computers out there in the world, that are processing Bitcoin transactions in this decentralized network, and you smooshed them all together, it might look like something like Amazon's cloud business, Amazon's web services business, right? Um, and yet nobody paid for that to happen. Like it just emerged because of this concept of the block reward, which is miners get Bitcoin for clearing Bitcoin transactions. And I think in some ways that's the most genius part of the system is that the incentive is built into the protocol. 
Yes, I think that uh, that's totally right. And I think that's a part of it that was maybe harder to see for a while, right? right. You know, initially it was like, oh, decentralized trust, that's amazing. Right. But it was that reward system because you had at that point all these open source collaborations that had existed where people basically just out of their sense of goodwill or their intellectual interest or their belief in the importance of open architectures had contributed their time or their servers or whatever it is to these projects without amazingly an amazing amount of stuff got built without a clear economic reward right like and linux like linux. linux gets there's no right. you know mechanism for kind of paying people initially in in that but with Bitcoin, all of that changes. Right. And suddenly, now of course it's dependent on the coin having some kind of transferable value right. into the real world. And that's, right. and that's, once that started to become visible, that's when it becomes really interesting. Well, and so another, I think, fundamental piece of this is that there's only 21 million Bitcoins will ever be mined, right? So there is a fixed supply of Bitcoin and there are enough people in the world who believed that therefore it was scarce and valuable and they wanted to own it, right? That happened. And once that happens, it, be, again, it's like a belief system. I mean, look, so is the US dollar, right? What's backing the US dollar? Nothing, the full faith and trust of the US government, right? That's it, but that's a big deal, right? Like we believe that the US government will make good on that money, so we're happy to own it, right? And so the people, the first people who started mining Bitcoin or buying Bitcoin believed that there was only 21 million of these things that were gonna get made and that they had value, that they could hold them and they could count on them being worth something sometime. Once you achieve that, you've got money. So we're kind of going back to another time. And you probably understand this better because you're such a student of history. There was a time when wealthy people, companies, other private actors would create script. They would create money. And that money was actually how communities would, would, would you know, exchange value. And then over maybe in the past two or 300 years, nation states took that over and they said like, stop making private money, we're gonna use the franc or we're gonna use the Deutschmark or we're gonna use the dollar. So we've gone to nation state money. And what we're doing here I think is we're going back in some ways to the idea that anybody can be a creator and an issuer of money. You have to believe in it. If you don't believe in it, it won't have value. But if you believe in it, it, it does have value. And then there's a point, I don't know, five years ago, I think, I would, I would say, from just reading things that you've written and other USV, and, uh, Albert, other USV partners, there's a certain point about five years ago where it, people began to realize, and I think you saw this as early as anybody, that we weren't really just talking about a currency. Right. And that in some ways, and this is somewhat where we start to use the phrase blockchain or the term blockchain to replace Bitcoin. Um, that this was really a, a kind of an underlying platform that was going to enable lots of things to be built on top of it. It wasn't just a way of trading value or, right. or buying things with some new kind of digital currency. I think what we all saw was this system that in the case of Bitcoin could cause you know, hundreds of thousands of computers all over the world to come together and cooperate around something and do it in a coordinated way and yet it wasn't owned by anything that could be used for many other things. And we've seen that uh, over time develop. And so, for example, we have a company that we help get started that makes something called Filecoin. And Filecoin is a very, I think it's a very obvious thing. I think you'll understand it. Um, the same basic idea, but instead of processing transactions in the Bitcoin network, you put storage on the network. Um, you make server farms, if you will, storage farms on the network, and you then create a decentralized Dropbox. And all of a sudden, there's big storage farms all over the world that are cooperating together in a decentralized network to create a massive amount of storage that is, and they're compensated with Filecoin, right? And so by putting the storage on the network, you get the Filecoin. So that's the Filecoin protocol. And then, the Ethereum protocol, which is a huge innovation, 
Vitalik Buterin, who's, who created Ethereum, had this idea that we could create something called smart contracts. And smart contracts are basically programs that, that enforce some logic, some contract, contract logic, really, on a decentralized network. And people are now using that as an application development platform, and things are getting built on top of the Ethereum network. And so when we started to see this emerge, we said, oh, this is like the internet. This is like a new layer of technology that's decentralized, like the internet that nobody can own, nobody can control. And there are these new protocols that are emerging, like the Filecoin protocol, or the Bitcoin protocol, or the Ethereum protocol, that will power new kinds of decentralized applications. That was like the big aha moment that kind of created the second wave. Like the first wave was just Bitcoin, and then the second wave was, oh, this is a new computing platform. This is a new technology platform. It's a new stack. Yeah. And through that, then at that point, you start to have the ICO phenomenon. Right. So you're creating these new currencies, not just Bitcoin. You have these other cryptocurrencies, like Filecoin. And this idea of an initial coin offering, right. kind of echoing an initial public offering, um, starts to emerge as a way to get some kind of outside value attached to this new emerging currency so that people will be encouraged to participate in the file coin right. system. Um, and that leads to some really exciting things and also some of the worst right. kind of scam garbage. Right. Uh, and that's kind of where we are at this moment where we have truly visionary people and some of the kind of worst parts of the internet colliding in this technology. Yeah. I think any time that there's money embedded in a system, there are going to be people who see it as a get-rich-quick scheme. And they have done that, right? And, you know, uh, I look, a lot of bad behavior, like if you, look, a lot of bad behavior happened on the internet, still does, and a lot of bad behavior has happened in this sector. I mean, we've had, you know, outright fraud, we've had things like Mt. Gox where, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars were lost in a massive hack and collapse of a big Bitcoin exchange. We've had the Silk Road, which was an illegal drug market being run on Bitcoin effectively. Um, and then we have the ICO market come along and we have very valid projects like the Ethereum project, which really kind of invented ICOs raising the initial capital to seed what has become a very important piece of technology. And then we also have people who are just like scamming and, you know, taking money from unsuspecting people and running away and never doing anything, right? And so it's, it's a real problem. Uh, my hope is that we will come up with ways to police these systems and, 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 and minimize, if not, you know, uh, completely eradicate the bad behavior while allowing the, the interesting stuff to still flourish. But that is, as we've learned with the internet, a, if you have a truly open permissionless system where anybody can build anything on it, that's a, that's a hard problem. Yeah. And the other thing that I think is really interesting, I mean, you and I have lived through this from the kind of 90s on. We've seen several waves of kind of hype cycles. Right. Um, but this is a new twist on it. I mean, I, I don't, I'm curious about this room. I, I did a talk about blockchain in DC to a reasonably tech-savvy group um, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And I asked them, it was like 300 people. And I was like, how many of you have actually done some, performed some kind of transaction involving any cryptocurrency? And it was like five people in a room of 300. How many, how many in this room have? have... Yeah. So, so it's, it's about like, a third, maybe? Yeah. 20%? Yeah. A third? But you still, to have something that is so far from mass adoption, I mean, when we, you know, the, the late 90s hype of the internet, at least there were people buying things on Amazon and, you know, downloading, you know, Netscape. Um, there was clearly, you know, a mass uh, future for this. We've now gotten to this point where I think in part because people have seen these cycles before, we're able to kind of see the promise in these things and actually get a tremendous amount of money and interest in intellectual activity around something that actually hasn't yet okay. hit a mainstream audience. In the US. In the US. In South Korea, 75% of the citizens of South Korea have, has a crypto wallet and uses crypto fairly actively. I think this is, uh, this is something that um, is, is a lot more popular in certain parts of the world than the United States, which is a bit of a problem for the United States, I think. Um, we're not, I don't, 
I don't think we're like missing the boat because there's a lot of entrepreneurs here in the US and there's a lot of people like me who are funding these projects in the US, but there are other cultures that are embracing it more quickly than we are. You know, it's funny, I was thinking it, during the intro, one of the things that Fred is also really uh, an important part of his career is that he was one of the people who really led the tech sector finding a base here in New York City. And, and you know, in the early 90s, there was not a big tech presence here. It was really dominated by Silicon Valley and San Francisco and, and to a lesser extent, maybe Boston. Um, and that has really changed. And, and Fred and USV has been a big part of that. And I was thinking about that because one of the things about crypto in general and the blockchain in general is of the, of the whole technology sector, it's the one space that is actually not dominated by Silicon Valley. Right. Uh, not, maybe not even dominated by the United States. Right, right. I mean, there's a lot of Eastern European activity, right? right. And then there's a lot of, and there's a lot of Korean. Yeah, I was at a conference today, a, a crypto conference called Token Summit, and um, I was looking at the business cards I got, and from these were for people who were pitching me to invest in their projects. And, um, you know, they're from all over the world. I mean, you know, it's like Gibraltar. There was a guy from Gibraltar. Uh. Who lives in Gibraltar? <laughs> you know, China, Korea, you know, Slovenia. I mean, it's really a global thing, yeah. Um, yeah. which is kind of remarkable. Yeah, it's another side. It's geographically decentralized as well as kind of right. crypto decentralized. Um, but, you know, so you wrote this New York Times article, right? right. And so what was, the, what was the journey for you there and, and um, and how did that all come together for you? Well, it was shaped, uh, you know, by those kind of late, once I started to understand what you were talking about, by a bunch of conversations and a, and a bunch of things that were written at, uh, at USV on your blog and other, other things. But th I think one of the reasons why that article resonated was that I didn't set out to write an article about Bitcoin or the blockchain. Right. I said I was very much in the wake of uh, 2016, I started working on it in early 2017, and there had been this growing sense that there were these fundamental problems with the internet architecture as we knew it, and that the problems that had become all too apparent to us in 2016. And Walter Isaacson had actually just written this essay, I think for The Atlantic, that was, had a title like, The Internet is Broken, It's Time That We Fix It. And he kind of listed all these problems with the underlying architecture of the internet that you know had served us incredibly well for 40 years, but over time, because they'd been exploited in various ways, or because other companies had kind of filled in some of the holes that weren't there in the original architecture, uh, they'd become apparent that there were these problems. And so he kind of listed them on. And so I sent him an email after I read that article, and I was like, I agree with you, Walter. Like, so what is the mechanism for fixing the internet? Like, what is the decision-making body that is there that we could say, hey, we want to make these changes. Let's implement them. How would we do that? And he wrote back and said, no, you're right. It's, it would be impossible in this day and age. You can't fix it. You know? And I was like, well, that's incredibly depressing. Like, uh, you know, that's, why write, even bother writing the article if it's hopeless? Certainly, it's not going to be you know, the United States Department of Defense coming up with a new protocol and like, dropping it on the world. But, but you know what I've observed? In the world of technology, right as we throw up our hands and say it's yeah, hopeless, yeah something new emerges. Right. I mean, it happened with Microsoft. I mean, we remember when Microsoft had just taken over the entire like, PC world, right? And like, nobody could compete with them. The Justice Department's like, going after them for basically monopolizing the personal technology business. And then the internet comes, and open source comes, and poof, yeah. all of a sudden, my, my, and it's not like Microsoft's irrelevant, but like, they're not. We don't spend a lot of time right. lying awake at night worrying about Microsoft. And I think we're in another moment like that. Um, what Mark Andreessen said to me is, um, we didn't finish the job. Yeah. What happened was that the internet was built and we had TCP, IP, these are a couple of low level protocols, and then we had HTTP, which is Tim Berners-Lee, and the hypertext markup language is HTML, and we had a few more protocols like SMTP, which is email, and then we kind of stopped, and then big companies emerged, and all the innovation happened in Google, and in Yahoo, and in eBay, and in Amazon, and Facebook, and Apple, and we stopped making protocols. And that was great for a long time, but then all of a sudden we look back, and the 20 years later we haven't had a new protocol. And we need these protocols, um, because we need the internet to be open, and so now what's happening with blockchain and crypto is we're getting these new protocols again. We're getting, we're getting a payments protocol. We're getting a 
compute protocol, we're getting a file storage protocol, and the thing that these create is, is a shared data layer. This is super important. I wanna, I wanna try to explain this to you, because I think this is, there's one thing you need to understand, it's this. Okay, so this is what I was trying to explain upstairs. Uh, when you invest 10 years of your life in Facebook, you have all of your social network in Facebook, you have all your friends there, you know, your cousin's posting the baby pictures of you know, her new baby, and you gotta go there to see that. There's nowhere else to see it, because everybody's put their social network there. It all happens there. And if you don't like Facebook because of fake news, or you don't like Facebook because of the fact that, you know, they sold your data to Cambridge Analytica, or whatever, you can't really leave Facebook, right? Like, they got you. If there was a shared data layer, and if Facebook was built on a shared data layer, Someone could come along with, you know, Acebook, and you could leave Facebook to Acebook, and you could take all of that with you. You could take all your photos with you. You could take all your friends with you. They could stay on Facebook. A great example of this is email. You use Gmail. Let's say I use Outlook Mail. Let's say you use Yahoo Mail, and you use, you know, the mail that comes with, uh, you know, your cable provider. All our email can talk to each other because emails run on open protocol. And if I decide I want to leave Gmail and I want to go to Yahoo Mail, I can do that and I don't lose anything, right? That's because it's built on an open protocol. And what should have happened is Twitter should have been built on an open protocol and LinkedIn should have built on an open protocol and Facebook should have built on an open protocol. And we could choose to leave those and go to another application and not have to lose our data. It's a way for us to get back control of our data, and it's a way for us to lose the lock-in that these big companies have. And that is the great promise of this technology. It's the reason I'm so excited about it. I'm not that excited about it because I bought Bitcoin at 10 bucks and it's now worth 10,000. That's good, <laughs> but it's not really why I'm so excited about this. It's what I'm really excited about is it, I think it gets us back to the original ethos of the internet as this open network not a lockdown network. I have, that's, that's incredibly well said. I, I had this thing when I was writing that Times piece where my, my 16 year old son or then 15 year old son was like, Dad, we need to be buying Bitcoin. And I was like, <laughs> I cannot be buying Bitcoin while I'm writing this piece for the New York Times. No, that would, that would be a bad idea. That would be a bad idea. He's like, we're losing so much money, Dad. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I, that's I need to hire, I need to hire this kid. <laughs> I, know, yeah, I like I his know, commercial yeah, instincts. Oh God, it's really a problem. <laughs> um, so, but, but that's, the, you know, the story I always think of is, is when Tim Berners-Lee was inventing the web at CERN as a, you know, kind of programmer there in the, in the 80s, it, his original sketch for the web was just a personal kind of side project he had, uh, initially just to map the people in his new office. He was working at this incredible physics lab. There are all these brilliant people around. And he just wants to keep track of everyone he's meeting. And so he creates this little initial program that creates basically hyperlinks between somebody publishes a paper, well, that's linked to their identity. And if there's a collaborator on it, that's linked to that other person. He builds this kind of social, what we now call a social graph of the people around him. And that slowly evolves into this hypertext language. And there's a famous moment where he programmed the, the web on a Next computer, um, which is the company uh, that Steve Jobs founded that eventually sold to Apple. And it's basically the only thing that was created on a Next computer. It was not a successful <laughs> company, right? And there's a famous scene where um, they, they have a Next developers conference in Europe, and there's like 20 Next developers there. That's all they had. And Berners-Lee is kind of at the end of the line, and Jobs like shows up to see his 20 developers and looks at their projects, but doesn't make it all the way to the guy at the end of the line, and so never meets Berners-Lee, never gets to see that the most important innovation in the last 30 years has been created on one of his machines. And what I, I think there are two lessons in that story that connect, connect directly to what you just said, Fred, which is one, Berners-Lee had identity in the original web protocol, and it dropped out as it evolved. So there was a way of defining a page, a document, and a link between a document, and that just creating that convention, that kind of base layer definition, was incredibly revolutionary and it made Google possible, it made Amazon possible, it made all these things possible. But there wasn't a definition of me or you included in that. Email is the closest thing we have to that. We don't have identity, we don't have an open protocol for identity. Right. And the second thing is, 
as he's creating this revolutionary system, it is so under the radar that he can't even get attention when it's only 20 developers in the room. Nobody cared about it. And that's how all these open protocols were able to be developed in this decentralized, non-proprietary way, is because nobody gave a shit, basically. Right. Like, nobody really cared. And it was just a bunch of kind of geeks who were, who were working with these ideas. And that's what changed once the hype cycle of the internet right. happened. The second somebody was working on something interesting, like, hey, I've got a protocol for mapping the social graph. My I'm a college kid named Mark Zuckerberg. Um, instantly, he was able to raise all this money, right. and those protocols had to stay closed. Now, so I'll tell you a, a story that I think brings this home. So I put the original capital into Twitter. And um, when I put the original capital into Twitter, um, t Twitter was like six people or seven people. And we didn't have the engineering team to even keep the site up. And some of you might remember, in the early days of Twitter, it used to go down all the time. It was a fail whale, and like it just went down all the time. So we couldn't develop a lot of the functionality that you might expect. And so we opened up our API, and people built Twitter search and Twitter clients. And there was all this massive ecosystem around Twitter. It was basically just a protocol at that moment in time. And we had this moment, and we said, well, what if Twitter was a protocol? How would we make money? And we're like, we can't. There's no way. If like we let this be that you know all the value gets built on top of our protocol, and all we are is this low layer like just message router system. There's no money in that. And so we decided that we were going to close down the, the the API, lock it down, and start building a silo, and that we could make money with that. Right? Had there been at that moment? Now, by the way, that was a year before Satoshi Nakamoto wrote the white paper, literally a year before the white paper came out. If we had known then that we could have left it as an open protocol, and we could have put a token inside of it, and we could have issued ourselves 20% of those tokens, and then just let the whole thing go, we would have made way more money, I guarantee you, than we've made, and we made a lot of money in Twitter, but we would have made way more money because Twitter would have just it would have become the message routing system for the internet. It would have become like SMTP or TCP IP. And with a token inside of it, I think that's massive. Imagine if there was a token inside of TCP IP. Think about that. Everything in the entire internet runs on TCP IP. It's the guts of the whole thing. That's well, you said to me the other day that the, the core way of thinking about this is that we finally have a business model for open protocols. Correct. You know, for, for basically we had no business model for 30 years, but that was fine because there was no business model for anything. Right. <laughs> and then suddenly certain business models appeared and attracted all this interest and then we created these closed systems and that led us to a lot of the problems we have with Facebook, a lot of the problems we have, we have with identity online. Now we have a, a, a way of actually supporting the development economically as well as kind of intellectually and that's, and that's the big breakthrough. I think so. That's my view. We probably should go to the room. There's yeah, so many questions. I we, think they we, want we, us to Yeah, yeah. OK, <laughs> let's do it. How do we make this industry standard? Say, Gene and I are in the cannabis industry, and we believe that this should be the absolute underpinning. How do we do that? Well, you have to hire some engineers. Yeah. And you have to have those engineers design a system that um, uh, works on top of a blockchain and that solves some of the fundamental problems that you see with your industry and then you, you put that technology out there and you hope the industry adopts it. That's, that's how you do it. So you take a flying leap. And Correct. Then, and then you talk to all your friends and say you have to do this. You take a flying leap. I mean there are, the, you know, this is hyper experimentation. There's literally hundreds of thousands of projects out there now and you know most of them won't get adopted and a few of them will and those will become the st new standards. Is there anything that's already a standard? Bitcoin's a standard. Ether, probably. Ether, somewhere. at least the concept of a smart contract platform is a standard. Um, there are a couple of um, sort of privacy-based crypto networks like Zcash and Monero that I think are pretty well established. Um, uh, but yeah, there, there are a few things that have emerged that I think will, will last. Well, one thing we didn't quite touch on, which I think is also really important in this new business model for an open protocol, is with the coin architecture, the token architecture is sometimes called, um, you have a much blurrier line in terms of the, the value that's captured by these new systems, right? So instead of just being like shareholders, capture all the value, those might be employees or investors, and then customers get a product, hopefully, that they pay for or they don't pay for, but whatever. In the token model, that line gets a lot blurrier. You have people who 
create the protocol. You have people who help maintain it, who may not be employees of whatever organization has created the protocol, but are just miners or whatever service. You might reward coin to people who build applications using the protocol, uh, turning it into something. You might even uh, grant coins to early customers and say, hey, if you come to this service, use it, um, you'll get some coin. So it's a way of getting that kind of initial feedback loop up and running. There's two more uses of tokens that have emerged in the past year that I think are really super important. There's the concept of staking. So people stake tokens, they, they put skin in the game, and then they get, they get the right to do things. And then governance, yeah. governance tokens. The ability, if you own uh, tokens, you can vote on upgrades to the protocol. Super important. Um, I think we now learned in this country how important <laughs> voting is, oh. and don't we know? <laughs> so the follow-on question is 5G and quantum computing. Where does that fit? So in theory, quantum computing breaks uh, cryptography, which is the fundamental technology that all this is built on. I think we will get cryptographic algorithms that um, are unbreakable by quantum computing. We're in a little bit of a race. I actually see that's a risk, but I'm not thinking it's a huge risk. And what was the other question? Uh, uh, 5G, 5G networks? 5G. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think that's good. That's just, that's just more connectivity. I think that's a net positive for the world. Thank you. If someone is trying to do a token offering, would you recommend U.S. as domicile? Like no, no, I don't. In the next six months? No, uh, the question is, uh, uh, this is a regulatory question and a jurisdiction question. So the super interesting thing is, Stephen and I were talking about, this is a global phenomenon. And um, these ICOs, so one of our uh, companies we're involved in did an ICO last summer. And there were people who bought into the ICO from 170 countries. How many countries are there in the world? Not much more than that, yeah. 196 yeah. 170 different passports. And the reason we know this is that we did uh, KYC, Know Your Customer, on every single one of the buyers, like 12,000 buyers. And we looked at passports from 170 countries, right? This is a global financial market. Um, so the question is, if you do one of these token offerings, should you do it in the U.S.? under the U.S. laws, or should you do it outside the U.S.? Unfortunately, today, my advice would be don't do it in the U.S. Don't offer it to U.S. citizens and sell it to the rest of the world. It's a bad answer, but that's where we are right now. Any view in the future, like SEC is taking a position or any insight that in six to nine months it might be different? This, this is a philosophical question. The SEC's view is our number one job is to make sure that people don't lose money. That also means that their number one job is to make sure that people don't make money. That's just the truth. <laughs> yeah. Um, so sort of halfway through what you were talking about, my, my thought was how do these new apps make money if it's an open protocol and it's sort of open to everyone? You talked about Twitter and the fact that it had to be sort of within the silo. And so I, you talk about the tokenization and how that's going to drive value and allow them to create value. But my question is, how does somebody from the outside then value that token? Like, how do you think about what the token's worth? the value of that token? Uh, the most sophisticated thinkers on this question um, uh, believe that you value it more like a currency than you do a stock certificate. So. What we believe, and I think a lot of people would say we know, is that stocks are worth uh, a discounted cash flow of the future value of the dividends or cash flow associated with those shares, right? That's sort of classic you know, stock valuation. Um, currencies have some relationship between the velocity of money and the money supply, and um, uh, Nadine probably knows this. It's interest rates, um, Nadim knows a lot about currencies. <laughs> um, and so the theory, the thinking is these tokens are gonna behave a lot more like currencies and will be valued based on the way, you know, the dollar is, is valued or the euro is valued or the, the yen is valued. Um, or an emerging market currency. Or emerging market <laughs> currency. Um, and I think it, it may well be true that the markets are not appropriately valuing these tokens correctly right now. They could be undervaluing or they could be overvaluing them. 
Uh, but I think over time, I mean, I believe that over time markets will come to some equilibrium, but we may not be there right now. And then just on a follow-up, how do they get stolen? Like you talked about Mt. Gox, but like if it's so transparent and so right. secure, so the, so the how thing, do you see the, the thing is, they get stolen? Tokens are like <laughs> cash, okay? Um, I have some crypto on this phone. Um, not a lot. Not telling you how much. <laughs> not a lot, but I have some. If you pick up this phone, you get into my crypto wallet, which you probably wouldn't be able to because I've got a lot of security on it, you could send that crypto to your wallet and I can never get it back. There's no, like, well, like can there's you tell no... where it went? What? Can you tell where it went? You can see the address, but I don't know who that is. Um, so... If somebody does something fraudulent with my credit card, I can go to the credit card issuer and I can say, those are fraudulent transactions, and they, they shut them down, they give me back my money. That's because there is a central authority. We're talking about a network where there is no central authority. Once my tokens leave my crypto wallet and they go somewhere else, I can't get them back. So, of course, what hackers do is they try to hack into networks, they try to hack into computers, they try to hack into... Uh, places where there's a lot of crypto, and they try to get it. And once they get it, you're screwed. Questions about uh, the institutional side of things. Before you talk to, if you switch it all together, it would be like the Amazon cloud business. Is there a reason why you're not seeing more institutional business doing institutional mining? They're going to have the talent, the people, the resources, probably better ways to have energy savings than an individual. What's stopping that from becoming a I don't understand this. I wrote a blog post probably three or four years ago now saying, why aren't the largest money center banks in the world the largest miners of Bitcoin? I mean, they have massive transaction processing capabilities. They have huge data centers. This is their business, right? They're in the business of financial transactions. Why aren't they providing most of the mining power on the Bitcoin network and the Ethereum network? Like, that seems logical. Or even about Amazon itself. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if somebody inside Amazon or somebody inside Google or somebody inside Facebook is starting to mine. I think they're a little closer to maybe being able to get there. I just think it's like one of the things I've observed in 30 some years of doing venture capital is the biggest blind spots are always held by the people who are like the natural inheritors of the value of the innovation, mm. but they just can't see it. And sometimes you have to be a little far, you have to be a little removed from it to get it. Um, and the other question on the institutional side, going back to kind of trusted clearing organization, let's take the DTCC as an example. Right. Is there a way ultimately to talk to them and say, why don't you co-opt blockchain technology versus yeah. view it as a nemesis? I think that they're, they are, a lot of these people are doing that. But what they're not willing to do is they're not willing to truly open their business and operate in a truly open network that would allow anybody to clear, not just them. They're used to owning a monopoly on clearing. That anybody who's a central clearing house, de facto has a monopoly in, in that kind of a world, right? They are they're the ones that send stock certificates to, to different brokerage accounts. So I just don't think that they're interested in doing that. I think it's gonna be hard. My partner Brad talks about um, something which is um, the most disruptive technologies are things that the incumbents can't react to because it would completely decimate their business model. So you think of something like the mobile phone, right? It wasn't really that disruptive because anybody who had a web business could build a mobile app. It didn't really change their business. Facebook built a mobile app. Amazon built a mobile app. So it really wasn't disruptive. The internet was disruptive because all of a sudden, companies like Google were selling software for free with an advertising business model. So if you were a software company, you're like, I can't do that, right? I get paid for my software. I can't give it away. But of course, that was the move, right? So I think we're going to see the same thing here. How many years do you think we are with the <coughs> Someone who lived through the dot-com crash? Like the, the folks who thought Amazon was great were right. They just wound up being like, seven or eight years too early with significant losses that went with it. Like, from the moment that you can see this open protocol is going to we're actually also using it. So what, what do you think the timing is on that? Less than, re maybe repeat the, the question. Que the question is, how long are we away from mass adoption? And the, and the, the comment was like, 
you know, there's a lot of doubters about Amazon in 99, 2000, but by 2005 or 2006, it was clear that they were going to be a massive success, right? Do you like by 2012? Okay. <laughs> um, I think within 10 years, I'm not sure it's within five years. I do think there will be places where we will see um, success. One of the big problems, we didn't even talk about this, so important. Um, a trustless mechanism to clear transactions today is a very inefficient and slow system. Um, none of these blockchains can clear transactions like at anywhere near the speed of the Visa network. I think it's like five orders of magnitude slower than the Visa network. Like, like so you can't really build high throughput transactions on these systems, but you could build something that doesn't clear a lot of transactions. So I could imagine, for example, uh, home sale title clearing on a blockchain, right? Because there's just not that many transactions. But um, something that you would need real-time transaction processing, we're a long way away from that. And most consumer applications, I think, need that. That, that is Well, that, so this is a great question. The question is, can you achieve decentralization and efficiency? Think of it as a, as a continuum. Right? So the most efficient blockchains are highly centralized. A, a, a totally centralized blockchain is a database. Right? <laughs> and then you have some things that look kind of like a database, but they're just a little decentralized. If you go all the way over to Bitcoin, it's inefficient and slow. Right? So what we're, a lot of the innovation we're seeing now is like, where on that curve do you want to be? Like, can you be here versus here? So we're seeing new blockchains emerge where they're making trade-offs between decentralization and efficiency. I think a lot of the innovation is going to happen in the next three, four, or five years on that continuum. But I do think eventually we will get to highly scaled decentralized consensus mechanisms um, that are truly decentralized. But I, I, I think that's what is a ways away. It's a, it's a hard computer science problem. Do you think it is three to five years away? Uh, I think it's at least five years away for mainstream adoption of decentralized applications and could be as much as 10 years away. That doesn't mean, by the way, that you should just avoid the sector entirely because, I could, one, I could be wrong. <laughs> we have one more question. We haven't done that side of the room. No, let's do this side. What, what happens when Bitcoin hits its finite limit? How do you support the transaction? Uh, I'm pretty sure. The, the question is, the, the question is, what happens when Bitcoin hits its 21 million and you can't earn new Bitcoin from mining? Um, I, there will be a transaction fee. Right? There, there, miners will get paid a transaction fee for mining at that point. What's that mean? Uh, it's like a credit card, like your credit card. Like when you when you do a credit card transaction somebody pays the credit card processing company for clearing that transaction. Not you, but um, the, generally the merchant pays that. So uh, it'll be something like that. There'll be some sort of a transaction fee so the miners will still get compensated. They'll take some of your Bitcoin and give it to the miner for clearing the transaction. Great. Okay. So thank you both. And I just want to say, um, I had a long plane ride today, so I read Stephen's New York Times article, and I highly recommend it for you know those of us who are more on the lay side of the equation, because you, you do a very good job of making it clear, and certainly helped me understand this fascinating conversation. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.